yesterday we addressed uh, the affiliations topic and today we are trying to look into how communities can help us understand our own field of research. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Eugenio Ticelli. Um, Eugenio Ticelli from Mexico, Spain with Italian nationality as well has a keynote uh, entitled The Heaviness of Light and he wants to make us think of electronic literature in a different way. That's pretty much what we are looking for with this conference. Um, and he's going to talk about his personal experience and how we can create a sort of a map of potentialities for our future work. For him, electronic literature needs to be addressed in relation to the network of social, political, economic, and environmental sciences. He's a programmer, a writer, a researcher, a good man. <laughs> and he has explored different ways in which code influences our understanding of the world. You have that in the catalog, right? The 70, 770 pages catalog. <laughs> So let me just rewind a little bit and uh, bring to you a text that he wrote on 2011, which I'm sure you all know, but I just want to, make, to do the translation, the articulation with this talk, entitled, Why I Have Stopped Creating Elite. So thanks for coming back to the community, Eugenio. I'm just going to address some things. It all started, I'm quoting, it all started quite innocently. On January 2011, I traveled to Tanzania with the purpose of working with a group of subsistent farmers and engaged them in the creation of a collaborative online knowledge base of their practices, needs, and innovations. My intention was to propose this knowledge base as an interface for cross-sector communication between farmers and agricultural researchers. By becoming the dominant knowledge system and by resisting to engage in true interdisciplinary cross-sector research, most scientists have effectively become the blind leading the blinded. As I have learned these lessons, I try to find out how they could relate to a field in which I have been an active contributor during the past decade, electronic literature. A very popular catchphrase started to run around in my mind, think out of the box, and I immediately transformed it into think out of the book. These are my thoughts. I refuse to go on creating works of elite only for the sake of exploring new formats and supports, and I strongly disagree with studying elite exclusively from within the academic field of literature. Do we know where the minerals that are necessary to manufacture computers come from, and under what conditions they are extracted? What about the slave labor involved in manufacturing processes? As of today, I have decided to temporarily stop in creating new works of elite. I'm not saying that you should too. I deeply respect and admire the work of the international elite community. That's you all. I believe in individual freedom and because of that I also expect and hope to be challenged an update the day after. Dear friends, this morning I went for a walk along the Naviglio Grande in Milan and I entered a shop selling second-hand books. There I found a small book, The Computer in Art, by Zegia Richard, published in London in 1971. The book described the works of pioneers of computer art, such as Charles Ksuri, Michael Knoll, who were active at that time. A real gem. 
But the biggest surprise came when I turned to the last page on which the previous owner had written. I married on November 23rd. I would like to be a man, not an artist, not an engineer, a man. I took the book with me. Welcome, Rogeri Tissel. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here at such an early time. Really, I appreciate this. I really want to thank many, many people, but I, time is sort of running, but I really want to thank Rui uh, for putting so much love into this. I guess that you can all feel that this is a very special gathering, and so far, I don't know, I've been really overwhelmed by your efforts, by all that you're doing just to keep us happy and keep things flowing, so thank you, Rui. But I know that you're not alone. I know that uh, there's a lot of people also working together with you. I don't know all of your names, so thank you very much, all of the team, for making this possible. So, uh, I normally don't read, but this time I will read. Uh, I'll try to do so in a way which is not boring, because I know it's early and probably you didn't have coffee yet. You will at some point, I hope. Uh, so, I'm going to begin. I have some slides also. Okay. So, this talk is called uh, The Heaviness of Light. Um, let me start by trying to think about where we are as a community. As uh, Rui said, we're going to talk about community today, maybe these days dedicated to some extent to reflecting on what is a community, who are we as a community. And uh, at some point I actually thought about changing the title of my talk. Instead of the heaviness of light, I was thinking about our extended community. And for me the key word is extended, right? So I will, this term will come up during my presentation. So hopefully we can sort of think together about what could be our extended community and why do we need to think about an extended community. So I just wanted to begin with a quote from this person. Probably you know who this is, Milton Friedman. He's sort of the engineer of many of the economical worlds in which we live, which is actually one world, it's actually become an hegemony. He's considered to be the father of free markets. And to him, uh, I guess this quote really represents his thought. The role of statistics is not to discover the truth. The role of statistics is to resolve disagreements among people. So this frictionless social space brought about through the use of numbers. We don't care about truth, we just don't want to disagree. And this is the role of numbers. The insomnia of neoliberal reason produces digital monsters. The fierce mathematization of life began long ago, at the moment when humans assign a number to each hour of the day and to each year of their lives. Yet today, the digitalization of every recess of our existence and coexistence with others has become a suffocating reality. Through total computability, numbers have become the ultimate truth. An abstract hegemony that collapses contexts and erodes human languages, imposing upon them combinatorial, connective, and operational rules that render them efficient and functional, while converting them into raw data that feeds economic transactions. It is precisely upon this scenario where electronic literature takes place. It is precisely in the thick of this increasing abstraction where we stand as a community. However, abstraction or dematerialization, often wrongly identified as the essence of the digital, finds its contradiction in an exacerbated materiality that deviously escapes our perception. That which is described as immaterial in a rather myopic or naive fashion 
is only the final manifestation of complex assemblages of all sorts of materials hidden behind the veil of all sorts of heavy clouds. And the clouds will feature in this talk. But I don't really want to speak about language, which is sort of the prime matter with which we work. I would like to speak about the world. So the clouds, these clouds, they taste metallic. 36% of all the tin, 25% of all the cobalt, 15% of all the palladium, 15% of all the silver, 9% of all the gold, 2% of all the copper, and 1% of all the aluminium produced each year are used in the manufacturing of our electronic devices. The average smartphone, for example, contains 13.7 grams of copper, 0.189 of silver, 0.028 of gold, and 0.014 of palladium per 100 grams of material, together with other significant minerals such as cobalt, lithium, nickel, tin, zinc, chrome, tantalum, and cadmium. Yes, mining is experiencing a renewed glory, thanks in part to our endless hunger for digital devices, and thanks also in part to the way in which we now read, code, and write. Here we click. From beneath the Earth's crust, they extract minerals. But let's admit that the global mining industry is not renowned precisely for its good practices. Let's look at two examples. In The Looting Machine, journalist Tom Burgess traced the impossibly dark and twisted pathways of African mining. I'm going to quote him. Militias and the Congolese army directly control some mining operations and extract taxes and protection money from others. Corrupt officials facilitate the trade. The comptoirs or trading houses of Goma on the border with Rwanda orchestrate the flow or both officially declared mineral exports and smuggled cargoes. Other illicit routes run directly from mines across the Rwandan and Ugandan borders. UN investigators have documented European and Asian companies purchasing pillaged Congolese minerals. Once the ores are out of the country, it is a simple step to refine them and then sell the gold, tin or tantalum to manufacturers. The road may be circuitous, but it leads from the heart of Congo's war to anywhere mobile phones and laptops can be found. So this is about trade. Meanwhile, in Mexico, the country where I was born, chemical products used in mining operations are polluting vital sources of water, negatively impacting the health of about 70% of the exposed population. Mining not only affects the health of humans and ecosystems, but in a truly neo-colonialist fashion, it also disrupts the country's economy. After NAFTA and their subsequent reforms to Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution in 2013, the activity of foreign mining companies has greatly intensified, bringing an unprecedented plunder. Data compiled by the Red Mexicana de Afectados por la Minería, um, that since NAFTA came into force in the 90s, uh, 450 tons of gold have been extracted from Mexico, almost three times the amount extracted during the 300 years of Spanish domination. This enormous outflow has particularly benefited Canadian and North American companies, who almost hold 80%, 85% sorry, of all private mining concessions, and therefore can be regarded in practical terms as a binational monopoly. Yet these companies pay less than 1% of their profits in taxes to the Mexican government, who has actively encouraged and even safeguarded this pillage by mobilizing military and police forces in order to protect the interests of foreign mining companies from the active resistance of the affected populations. So this is front page news from a few days ago in Tanzania. Uh, it appears that the uh, Tanzanian government is sort of trying to blow back on the operations of miners. Uh, Tanzania is the third largest producer of gold and gold is uh, prominently featured in our smartphones. It's a great semiconductor, so uh, it's there in your pockets. 
but the Tanzanian go government appeared to be sort of trying to limit the miners, in this case the Australian miners. Uh, none of this is happening in Mexico, sadly, uh, quite the contrary. But let's just see if this is just demagogy or if it's going to be for real. But what do these issues mean to us, the electronic literature community? How are we supposed to make sense of such an overwhelmingly complex state of affairs that nevertheless presses, on from every, presses us on every side? As we gather, the clouds gather too as the poet J.R. Carpenter has warned us. The clouds loom ever darker over our heads, beneath our screens. They shift shape, morphing from allegory and metaphor into the concrete, breathable cloudness of gases and suspended particles. As artist Joanna Moll reminds us in her piece, CO2 Google, it's like a play of words between CO2 and Google, the seemingly harmless act of navigating the digital cloud results in measurable quantities of greenhouse gases emitted by servers located throughout our planet. So how do we connect the disruption of the Earth's ecosystems as carried out by the extractive industries in the Congo, Mexico and elsewhere, or as provoked by our daily online activities with electronic literature? Let's explore these interconnections together. But first of all, a warning. This exploration will not be an exercise of self-destructive guilt. It would be absurd to affirm that the damage done by mining and the burning of fossil fuels is deterministically caused by our increasing consumption of energy and electronic gadgets, and therefore that we are to blame. Yes, we do play an active role in this cyclopean mess, but the system is too entangled to establish deterministic causalities. The different sources of materials used in the manufacturing of our devices, for example, are notably difficult to trace, and trying to do so would entail a deep and perhaps even dangerous research. We live, work, and communicate in a hijacked utopia. Yes, we need justice, but we also need to keep walking, and for that we need to get rid of the burden of guilt. Secondly, I will avoid the easy path that leads to the outright condemnation of electronic technologies. Let's not fall prey of reductionist dichotomies, such as good versus evil or love versus hate. The aim of the other path we are about to take, I want to emphasize, is to, co is to come close to a different, more nuanced understanding of technology. It is therefore my intention to propose and discuss a number of questions that may help us move beyond this incapacitating entanglement. The question of restraint, the question of cultivating a pharmacological consciousness of technology, and the question of togetherness. In this text, I will explore these questions from the point of view of the community. Now, it has become all too common to find the notion of community being uncritically summoned as a purifying lotion even in the most unexpected environments, such as corporations or the financial sector. But we must be cautious. It is precisely because this notion is undergoing a thorough abuse that we run the risk of readily assuming that we know what a community is. But what is a community? Or perhaps more interestingly, interestingly uh, what forms of existence can a community bring forth? These are questions. Of the many possible definitions of community, the one I prefer is that which says that a community is a group of people who share a common set of symbols, but not necessarily a common set of meanings. Contrasting with other notions of community which focus on social structures, I find that this symbolic approach offers a high degree of flexibility and therefore allows us to understand communities as an ever-shifting space of exchange. According to this definition, members of a community agree on common symbols, but are not required to agree on what those symbols mean. Thus, the detachment of symbol and meaning opens up the possibility of thinking about heterogeneous communities formed by individuals with possibly contrasting views who are nevertheless bonded together through mutual agreements that need to be constantly renewed. We as a community gather periodically to take care of the symbols we have in common. We also discuss their meanings and we may agree to disagree without disrupting our common body. However, this definition of community implies that a community's boundaries are, in turn, 
defined by the symbols that its members share. Those that do not share our symbols are thus excluded. Yet the natural symbolic enclosure of a community is perhaps something we should question, as it runs the risk of defining the boundaries of our affects as well. But in times of interconnected ecological, economic, and social catastrophes, how can communities go beyond their symbolic limits in order to create significant bonds of solidarity with those outside their boundaries? The symbols that we share as members of the e-literature community are not even accessible to the miners that are forced at gunpoint down the tunnels of Katanga in Eastern Congo. Yet we carry the fruit of their toil in our pockets. How can we include them in our work, not as symbols, but as comrades? Can we imagine an extended community in which care and coexistence do not necessarily have to cross through a symbolic border? To think the extended community, we must begin to ask many questions. Who renders who capable of what and at what cost? Who are those invisible presences that quietly make our own community possible? Are they all human? Where do we draw the boundary that defines who should be included? Miners? Mines? Minerals? Should there be a boundary at all? And what would be the agreements that keep the extended community together? There are too many questions, such a heavy burden, but uh, let me now try to unpack a little bit. So, restraint. Uh, Rui already read a little bit of what I wrote some years ago. Uh, restraint and even withdrawal from the production and consumption of electronic literature can be an ethical choice which, despite being essentially individual, may bring about consequences to the entire community. The choice I made a few years ago was to withdraw and I want to briefly describe this experience. So I'm not going to read the passage again because we already read it. Here is a little piece. But I, I just want to say a few words additional words about this. My awareness of the destructive effects of our appetite for digital devices was greatly sharpened after a visit to a community in Tanzania that was suffering the consequences of the careless practices of gold miners, waters polluted with arsenic, dying crops and animals, people with skin problems and other strange and unprecedented diseases. Upon seeing all this, I desperately wrote the rather melodramatic note that Rui just read. Uh, and impulsively posted it on Facebook. My intention was to start a conversation about topics which I found largely absent in our writings, uh, conferences, and festivals. But my gesture was soon criticized, and rightly so. For instance, in her text, The Peripheral Future, Lisa Swanstrom wrote, I don't know Eugenio Ticelli, but I remember being in equal portions impressed by the conviction of his stance and irritated by the futility it suggested. Tiselli's refusal to participate, it seemed to me then, was less an act of artistic defiance than a gesture of capitulation to the very aesthetic of erasure he criticized. And I must admit that she was right about the futility of my radical restraint. I soon felt its very contradiction inside myself, turning at me with force, Although my decision to stop creating elite works was more closely related to Bartleby's I'd prefer not to, than to defeat, I soon felt the need to go beyond immobility, to untie the knot, to solve or at least fully understand the paradox in which I was immersed. I needed to break the machine in order to see it as it really was, to make it present at hand, as Heidegger would suggest. So I started a detailed research on the enigma of technology, because it's an enigma, I believe. Now, after six years, I have to start to say that my research is nowhere near its end, and perhaps it never will be. Uh, however, my quest so far has given some fruits, and this is what I want to share now with you. So yes, the pharmacon. Lately, I have substituted my full restraint for a much more fruitful approach. Uh, following the theories of Bernard Stiegler, I am trying to cultivate a pharmacological attitude towards technology. 
Ziegler argued that we are living through a multifaceted crisis, largely triggered by a breakdown of the relationship between technology and society. Such a crisis brings about a pharmacological consciousness in which we become aware of the toxic nature of technology. This consciousness is quickly becoming more and more acute and widespread and should give rise to a pharmacological attitude through which, instead of adapting ourselves to a technological environment, we become capable of adopting it. So there is this, this huge difference between adaptation and adoption. We often feel that the experience of adapting to the ever-increasing array of technologies is an imposition. According to Stigler, when I adapt myself to technology, I become proletarized. That is, I progressively lose my autonomy and ability or savoir-faire by delegating significant aspects of my existence to the dark machinations of the black boxes. But rather than simply rejecting this aspect of technology, I can reverse its proletarizing effects by adopting it, by becoming one with the wound that it inflicts, by recognizing that technology is the human wound. Therefore, by refusing to adapt to the toxic religion of Silicon Valley, by leapfrogging the impoverished social rationalism of Facebook, by, this, and by dismantling the black boxes of Google, we produce bifurcations. We learn to live with the digital, not against it, but with it in a different way. We adopt technologies in order to coexist with them, but in a different, more intimate way. But above all, cultivating a pharmacological consciousness in our digital world implies both an intellectual and practical journey in search of the right dose. In much of the same way that pharmacology studies the interaction between the pharmacon and the organism, be it individual or collective, uh, technological pharmacology investigates the ways in which technological artifacts cure or harm our individual and collective minds, bodies and souls. A pharmacon is simultaneously that which allows us to take care and cure and that which we should be careful of. It is a healing power in the same measure as it is a destructive one, and the difference lies in the dose. Thus, a pharmacological attitude is a constant questioning about the right dosage of technology that we need before falling into harm, sickness, and death. But there is no right dose, in the sense of a universally valid measure of restraint or engagement with technology. The dose, in any case, will always be related to the plane on which we stand, as well as the particular yet interconnected ecosystems and communities we are part of. Therefore, I suggest that the capacity to trace connections of causality between planes of existence is a crucial ability we will need to acquire if we want to follow the pharmacological path and cultivate solidarity with our extended community. I believe that it is precisely such ability that will bring dosages and thresholds into view. Now, to say everything is connected is meaningless. It has become one of the catchphrases of our times. But, we should, but should we really assume that connections between everything exist by default and therefore regard them as, as a given? Uh, maybe we'd better not. Uh, as Graham Harmon put it, Everything is not connected, which means that actually things withdraw from each other and mostly tend to avoid making contact. Therefore, rather than being a self-evident fact, contact, connection and coexistence within things are rare phenomena that need to be explored and explained. Things such, a gold, such as a gold mine and an e-poem are apparently disconnected from each other, each of them existing in its own reality vacuum, within separate, seemingly unrelated planes and contexts. We could be lazy and just assume that, yes, uh, minds and e-poetry are connected somehow, but how exactly? Perhaps they do make contact, but we need to make the effort of tracing the causal threat between them to recognize the many other things that exist along that thread. To explain, that is, to disentangle. Not doing so would be the true capitulation, the ultimate surrender to the blindfold of proletarization.
But where are we? Uh, this is how I started, so I come back to question. Where are we? What is this epoch that we suddenly found ourselves in? Um, according to environmental scientists Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer, the Earth has entered a new geological era, the Anthropocene, in which human agency becomes a tectonic force. Uh, supposedly starting at the same time as the Industrial Revolution, the Anthropocene has brought incremental and cumulative transformation on a planetary scale, such as anthropogenic climate change. Now, there is quite a controversy related to the term Anthropocene. I chose this picture, this painting, sorry, from uh, Goya, to illustrate this controversy and what is actually, uh, what I think that is actually happening. Uh, this famous painting, as you know, is uh, called Duel with Cudgels. And uh, as you can see, uh, you cannot really tell who is going to win one of the two fighters. Um, but uh, following Michel Serret, he suggests that uh, the one who is actually going to win is the quicksand, where they're sinking. Uh, and that's a really ignored third uh, fighter, right? So these are the controversies that we find ourselves in where we're sinking in, in quicksand. And so uh, the Anthropocene has been uh, contested, the term itself. Uh, some authors have proposed the Capitalocene, which highlights uh, capitalism as a world ecology that co-creates nature. But in parallel to that, also the Plantationocene has been proposed. As you know, uh, plantation uh, is um, a form of exploitation that became the economic basis of, uh, of the European colonial period and they're still favored by mainstream agriculture today. So, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, then Stiegler also speaks about the Anthropocene, which is the age of entropy. Uh, so, the dispute over how to name and therefore to understand the new geological area in which we presumably are already has not been settled. Nevertheless, what these different terms have in common is the feeling that we are experiencing the consequences of the violence that we as a species have inflicted upon our extended community. It really does matter why, how and when the violence started. And this is something that needs to be discussed carefully. But regardless of the term we choose to make sense of the stormy clouds that loom upon us, we need to start realizing that our historical lack of capacity to think about the connections that arise between things, to trace implications and co-implications, to hear the resonances of other times and spaces is precisely what has thrown us under these dark, violent skies. And for us here, it is crucial to acknowledge that we must count violence as one of the many foundations of our digital literary culture, of our e-literature. But how do we start the engines of connection in order to begin the task of finding our extended community in the midst of violence? I believe that we should be able to think differently about who we are and what we do. We can achieve this, we can achieve such a mindset by turning our attention to our extended community. To imagine a new togetherness, we should think about the invisible others, not only in a connective way, but also in a compositional one, in order to recompose assemblages of hyperaccelerated molecules, wildly fractalizing cells, fragmented languages, broken affects, our inter interdependence interrupted by the nightmares of competition, recompose shattered lives, devastated forests, melting glaciers, dying corals. But how? So I'm going to speak a little bit about intimacy. How do things touch? How do they wake each other up from the deep sleep of decomposition? Timothy Morton suggested that we may find an answer in art, since art may be regarded as an experimental workshop in which the relations of causality that weave things together can be studied and tampered with. So Morton argued that to study a thing is to examine how causality itself operates. So to explain and expose a thing poetically, is to carry out a nonviolent political act in which its coexistence can be seen and traced in detail. It is an act of recomposing the sisterhood of things. 
but how can we build these bridges? Uh, sometimes we feel like we are fish inside a fishbowl, looking at the spectacle of climate change and economic collapse. Uh, should we build a bridge and try to understand that? How, how can we become closer to this extremely large phenomenon? Uh, perhaps we don't need to look for bridges, but rather a new kind of relational perception that is open to this phenomenon, which Morton calls hyperobjects. Hyperobjects are things which are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans, and therefore are impossible for us to perceive directly, as we would perceive a flower or a gust of wind. However, it is actually possible to detect hyperobjects, but only in a space that consists of interrelationships between the aesthetic properties of objects. So I believe that hyperobjects could become a useful tool for thinking about the complex phenomena that happen at enormous time scales in remote spaces uh, because the relational nature comes in the form of aesthetic perception as well as an acute awareness of our extended community. And yes, uh, we don't need to go to Tanzania. Uh, there is an intimacy with hyperobjects, actually. Uh, the poisonous fumes of millions, millions of cars and thousands of factories floated directly into my nostrils as I typed this text in Mexico City. Weeks later, when I corrected it, I suffered from the hypnotic effects of a rare heat wave in Barcelona, of which the CO2 emissions of transatlantic flights, such as the one I took between the two cities, are a significant cause. The electrical impulses that run through the circuits of my computer, as I code an e-poem, find their way through pathways made of minerals that form as a consequence of ancient tonic flows deep below the lands of eastern Congo or Mexico. We don't really know. It's all here right beneath my fingertips. We touch. It all enters and exits my body. Just by sitting in my place, I am involved in an immensely rich and intricate web of aesthetic relations in which I touch and I'm being touched, both in, both in violent and loving ways. I'm going to go a bit further and uh, I'm going to sort of try to skip some parts because I feel that time is running out. So, this weird form of togetherness has been presented by Donna Haraway uh, as the Cthulhu scene. The Cthulhu scene is an intimate entanglement made up of strange tentacular ketonic beings with which we must think, labor, and love. For Haraway, the mantra of the epoch is to stay with the trouble. Despite the looming disasters, the game is not over, and we have nowhere to run to. So to stay with the trouble means to live through global warming, mass extinction, socioeconomic collapse, total war with neither hope nor despair, yet avoiding cynicism. It means to accept that we will require to become with each other in unexpected collaborations and combinations. That is the extended community. Or not at all. The Cthulhu scene is perhaps best understood as a conceptual tool that reveals the unprecedented degree of sympoesis we need to achieve with our extended community. So in short, sympoesis is to collectively produce systems that do not have self-defined spatial or temporal boundaries in which information and control are distributed among its components. So, this is just a map of different things, uh, the extended community, hyperobjects, intimacy, the Cthulhu scene, staying with the trouble. So, uh, can we think about a different way of doing things? Can we create a new poetic that may assist us in the task of caring for the contradictory and strange beings that we need to recompose with? I believe that we as a literature community have a very good chance of doing that. Our community of e-writers and e-readers already engages quite deeply with technologies that intensively represent some of the hyper-objects that creep into our everyday algorithms, server, server farms, submarine cables, radio frequencies. We tinker and play around with tools and means that more than any other previous invention enable us to reach out to our extended community.
yet we must reach a level of awareness that allows us to recognize that under a pharmacological attitude, through intimacy with hyperobjects, and because of our togetherness with catonic entities, our work becomes a labor of grief. There is pain in knowing that the world in which we were born has disappeared, and the supposed solidity of the ground upon which our feet used to stand has turned into a raging current of molten lava. We illiterates must acknowledge our co-participation with strange humans and recognize our complicity with strange non-humans. They all form with us the extended community with whose members we must think, speak, read, and write. We can welcome them by practicing what Cristina Rivera Garza calls disappropriation. Instead of veiling our complicity with others behind the myth of the individual genius, we must explicitly incorporate them in our work, which is both physical and communal. So I just wanted to briefly end, and I will and so that there is at least, at least some 10 minutes for questions and comments. Um, this is what I've been trying to do in these years, this last year since there are many people here I have not seen in many, many years. And that's because I've been mostly working in Tanzania. And I've been trying to do uh, a little bit of what I just read and also learning from what I've been doing, learning from farmers who are actually uh, experts in resilience, experts in adopting technology rather than adapting to it. Uh, I've been trying to uh, engage with farmers, incorporating them into open-ended processes of collective writing, and that is the project that I have been working on, Saudi Yawakulima, which was actually shaped by the farmers themselves. Uh, there is an installation of Saudi Yawakulima at uh, one of the exhibitions, so I invite you to look uh, at the pictures sent by the farmers, listen to their voices, and I'm just going to uh, briefly end. As we welcome the others into our writing, we must acknowledge that we sit almost at the top end of a trophic entanglement. Indeed, we find ourselves in the paradoxical yet privileged position of using devices made from recklessly extracted minerals to tell stories about the reckless extraction of minerals. We cause machines to burp CO2 into the Earth's atmosphere in order to write about the alarming levels of greenhouse gas emissions. This paradox is hardly avoidable, as it reflects a deep contradiction that lies at the heart of our culture. To create, we must destroy. Or we could cite Benjamin, who said that there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time a document of barbarism. However, our privilege can be hacked by listening to the call, the call from the hitherto silenced and ignored members of our extended community. There will be no future of writing without their writing. Thank you. <laughs>